Ladies and gentlemen, I've been asked to put a little bit of attention towards thou or that and his video Incarnate Ideas. This was posted January 22nd and he says a surprisingly coherent thesis statement at the beginning. He, in this video is going to say why some uh, version of Plato's idea of world of forms, uh, Plato's philosophy in some form, needs to be resurrected or then he makes the qualifier or just kept, you know, if there's one around. But then he gets a little sillier. It is in speech that ideas come to self-understanding, he says. In speaking, ideas understand themselves, is what he says. That's his grammatical meaning. Well, look, we, we understand ideas by understanding the concretes behind them. The idea of, of green cannot be understood in a platonic sense if you divorce it from everything in reality. What you have to do is show someone something green and say by green I mean this color. Um, so it's only through perception of reality that ideas can be understood because only ideas that refer to reality are valid. But he's not talking about any of that at all. He, because he says that prior to um, our experience with ideas communication in the body or something like this, some drivel. Prior to ideas actually having something to do with humans, they are merely uh, possibilities, that they have a merely possible reality. Well, before they have anything to do with humans, they don't exist at all. So that's just drivel. He does say something which I don't think he understands, or else he wouldn't be saying some of the other stuff. He says that Ideas become, this is around uh, 1 minute and 10 seconds, ideas become real only in the interaction between a, a person and reality, the person with ideas and reality. He's coming as close to a correct understanding as he's ever going to, but like I said, I don't think he understands that. That, that means that reality and our ideas have to coincide, and that's the only way ideas can be valid, and that's the only way we can deal with reality, but the one caveat I have to add is that our, our five senses are the way of doing that, and he would not agree with that. He thinks that we can investigate ideas without the five senses or before the five senses. Um, so, from about 1 minute 30 seconds to 1 minute 50, he gives a fairly good reading of Plato, and then he says, I think that's an unfortunate reading of Plato. The idea that there's another realm up above and beyond and better and higher than this one, that the world of forms or heaven or whatever. So he gives a good summation of Plato and then says that's an unfortunate reading. Then he says hilariously at two minutes exactly that there's a Christian inflection of Plato that he wants to offer. Not knowing apparently that everything that we call Christianity is simply an outgrowth of Plato's philosophy. Then he babbles about the union of union and difference and the identity of identity and difference which he doesn't know what he means because it doesn't mean anything. So in Christianity we have the divine coming into the world and realizing itself fully. I don't know, God didn't come down, only Christ his son came down. Um, and it's all just a bunch of stories about spooks anyway, so I don't know what philosophically he wants to do with it. But Plato wouldn't say that bringing the divine down into the corrupt world of shadows is in any way fulfilling it. Not at all. But if, if all he means is he wants to take go away from Plato a little bit so that we can bring a piece of heaven down onto earth like the Christians did. They said, well, what if a piece of perfect heaven did come down? Brilliant. All right, if that's all he's got to do. Now, I have to say, I think that Thou Art That would be a good candidate for theology because theology is where you take um, a bunch of floating nonsense that has nothing to do with reality and talk about it endlessly. Um, and that's what he's doing here. He's talking about Plato's idea of a world of forms, plus the idea that Christianity brought that a little piece of that heaven came down to earth, and he's talking about uniting them in some way or something like that, and both of these little pieces of fairy tale nonsense are that, fairy tale nonsense, and he's spending time, brain calories, minutes, thinking about it. I had a good metaphor about um, what people do with their brains, and Professor Anton jabs his with needles and stuff and uh, thou art that put his brain in a black box and close the lid and he's wondering if he has a brain but he won't look inside and uh, I'll, I'll come up with some others
So at 3 minutes and 40 seconds, or 3 minutes and 35 seconds, he says, understanding doesn't take place merely in the abstract. So, well, he is obviously completely clueless about what understanding is. Again, understanding means to concretize. So to understand something, you have to bring it to the concrete. That's a tautology to say it doesn't take place merely in the abstract. But he'll go further and he'll say sometimes it can take place in the abstract or something, or else he wouldn't claim to have any idea about Christianity or Plato's world of forms. So there must be something you can understand abstractly without reality getting involved, according to him. I mean, there's not, but according to him there must be, or he wouldn't be thinking about all these fairy tales. But get what he says why understanding does take place at 3 minutes and 40 seconds. It takes place because, now I would say understanding takes place because we need to understand reality to live in it, or understanding of the world takes place because we use our senses plus reason to integrate that. He says it's because the soul desires knowledge. Really maybe a poetic way to put what I said. Maybe a poetic and stupid way to put what I said to come into understanding with things. Then he babbles. Babbles about a dialectical relationship between knowing and being. And you couldn't have knowledge if you didn't exist. And uh, knowing anything at all, in other words, having any knowledge at all, being conscious, means you, that you do exist. So the duality between these things is, has been laid down ages ago. Ages ago. And um, it's not worth uh, babbling on and on about and wondering why ideas have to be understood only through the senses. Because there's nothing else except for the world of the senses. Anything that exists can be understood through the senses and only through the senses. Okay, at two, uh, five minutes he says that Richard Dawkins cannot reflect on the pre-theoretical assumptions that he makes when someone says something about the selfish gene, he says, oh, I don't really mean the genes, or selfish, I mean something else. Thou art that is confused by that metaphor. He asks, what's the relationship between human description and objective nature? Now, what does he mean by human description and objective nature as per Richard Dawkins' concept of the selfish gene? Um, I can say this much, I'm sure, I'm sure he hasn't read the book or he wouldn't be so confused about the meaning of the metaphor. And if he did, he didn't understand a single paragraph in it, or he wouldn't be this confused. I just had to put that in there to defend Richard Dawkins, whom has not taken a single abrasive hit from thou art that in this case, so uh, not a lot of defense to be done, but uh, to attack thou art that in his attack against the imperishable Dawkins, who wrote a book called the God Delusion. You've got to like him for that, but he's, uh, he puts altruism at the base of ethics. I'll, I'll rub with him on that. I don't think altruism is the base of ethics, but uh, that's aside from the non-point here. Now he says at 5 minutes 55 seconds that we can't do away with the transcendental and focus only on the imminent. By transcendental he means things above and beyond, things more beautiful, the, the higher bits of reality or something like that. It Technically the word means be things beyond reality, but um, as Christopher Hitchens uses the word, it just means the finer arts or the finer points in literature or thought or, or philosophy, and this, this is the, in the transcendental realm. As Hitchens says, when you're feeling some feeling of awe watching a musical piece or reading a, a great book or something, you have this feeling of awe, it doesn't necessarily refer to a god. It doesn't refer to a supernatural realm. Indeed, it can't, because there is no god, there is no supernatural realm. Right? Well, Thou Art That thinks that if we disregard the supernatural realm, we'll be left just with the physical realm, which is enough to contain all the awe that he can handle, by the way. Just look at the Hubble Deep Field. But being stuck, he believes, in this physical realm, without the mind, as it were, uh, will have nothing but industrial capitalism, he says. I don't know what would be wrong with that, as long as I can put in the caveat that all of the transcendental you can ever handle is available in this reality. You don't need to go to another realm or world of forms or anything.